Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I am honored to be speaking to the man behind such uh, game scores as Bioshock, Destroy All Humans, Shadow of Mordor. I'd like to welcome Gary Scheinman. How are you doing? Good. Good yeah? to be here, Rhys. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I know you must sure. be a very busy man. Happy, happy to do it. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to know is getting your start in the industry because you really kind of got known by Destroy All Humans. Was that something uh, that you planned out from the beginning to become to get involved in the video game industry or were you kind of settling in the whole film television space? Well, I go back certainly uh, a lot further than that. I started in the 80s. Uh, scoring shows like the A-Team and Magnum P.I. and Greatest American Hero. When I, I studied at USC, University of Southern California, and uh, graduated with uh, the d a degree in composition, a music comp, and with the absolute desire to become a film and television composer. Uh, games were not an option back then. They just weren't uh, technically advanced enough really to want sophisticated music or even just the technology had not made that possible. I did score some games in the early 90s for uh, an application or a company called Philips Electronics, which you may know from the Netherlands, They're Netherlands or Denmark, one of those two countries. And um, they had a technology called CDI, CD Interactive. CD was a new relatively new format back then and was in a permitted you to actually record uh, film and audio into a format that was sort of like a movie tree. It actually, is, it's actually the term video game very much fits that format where you, so I scored a bunch of scenes that then you as a player would make choices about what, what you were, what you would do next, you know? Mm. So I did score those, uh, but that was just sort of a one-off. A friend of mine was a producer at Philips Interactive. And um, and then I that company actually went out of business. And I didn't score any games again until 2004, when purely by serendipity, pure, 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 pure happenstance, my agent at the time put my... Uh, I sent the resume over to uh, THQ, which which was a big uh, publisher at the time. They're also out of business. I'm putting these companies out of business. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but it was uh, he sent over a resume to them on a fax machine, which was still a relevant technology. Although I'm discovering it's a relevant technology now, because if you want to communicate with the Internal Revenue Service, uh, they you can't send them email. It's hard as hell to get them on the phone so, so that you can fax them. So I have to use, I have, I have to upload files to, a, you know, Hello Fax, which is an online service to fax to, because I don't have a fax machine anymore. In any event, um, it was on their fax machine and a woman who was a, a uh, an executive there, um, Rachel DiBiola, said, I know him. And Rachel, I hadn't seen her in years, but she was my girlfriend's roommate from college. And um, so it was like just serendipity and that that her noticing it and recognizing my name and saying, hey, you should listen to this guy's stuff to another woman who was uh, sort of like handling music for THQ got me an opportunity to score Destroy All Humans. So that was really my entry into what you would call the, the, the modern gaming industry. And that was uh, that was a great experience. But I, I started in, in the '80s, uh, working in television and film, and did a lot of it. And I still score occasionally score a film or some TV. So I'm not not exclusively a game composer. Although I would say most of my work is for games. Yeah, yeah. But were you aware of how much the the space had changed in the time you'd been gone because you said you did some CDI. No. I, I know a lot, a lot a lot of the older composers you had to use almost like code to to make some of the soundtrack and obviously that's no longer the case but when you were approached to do destroy all humans were you aware of how much it advanced or were you thinking uh okay i'm gonna <clears throat> no, be very I limited knew, i here. knew that video games were becoming big you know uh an important entertainment 
format, but I wasn't a gamer. And so when I did get involved, and of course, by then the technology had advanced where I wasn't, I didn't have to write code or I probably would still have no, no involvement in games. <laughs> I would be screwed. Um, but I was not required to write code. I just had to write music. And so, but I was sort of like taken aback by how interesting gaming had become. I was like, literally, I, I was like, you know, the, the, the kid on the farm coming into the big city, <laughs> like, really, you can do that? That's really cool. Um, so I was, I really was kind of blown away at how interesting gaming had become. And I enjoyed it very much. And I, and the game was successful and my music was nominated for some awards. And I was like, this is a cool, this is a cool thing. I want to get involved. So I really made a very much an affirmative effort to involve myself in gaming went to the Game Developers Conference. I have most years since then. I've only missed once or twice since 2005 was the first one I attended. And so that's really kind of uh, the genesis, just really some luck. And then hopefully uh, people thought I did a good job and uh, then people hiring me. Yeah, because you, you say you immersed yourself in gaming. <laughs> Because the problem is with gaming compared to say television or film is you usually have to invest a lot of hours into a game to really come to grips with it, right? But obviously as a musician, you're insanely busy. How do you find the time to even invest in gaming? Like let's say with Bioshock, right? I think that's like a 20 hour game or something. So would you play that from start to finish or would you just play bits and pieces, try and get the I play, grips? I, I, of course, while I was scoring it, I was not able to play it. Right. But when I was done, I did play it. And I've actually played it a couple of times because I really love the game. And yeah, I was yeah. willing to invest. You know, I didn't do it all in a 20 hour. I didn't stay up for 20 hours and not sleep and not eat or drink or whatever. Have a little toilet next to my <laughs> <laughs> desk or anything like that. You hear about people who really... Um, Every now and then you hear about some somebody who dies because they forgot to drink water for 26 hours or something crazy. Um, no, I, I but I was fascinated by it. And I also played World of Warcraft. So I really invested some time kind of getting my, under, get to get to understand what gaming was. And, and, and I, I, I do it less now because I don't have the time. Um, there's some games I want to play, but I just ha I, I haven't been able to pull myself or find find the time to really play it. But I do like to play the games that I have scored, if at all possible. I did. Right. I played Shadow of Mordor, uh, not all the way through, but a good portion of it. And then Short of War, I have not yet played because I just, I, I the um, knowing how many hours I would have had to invest has been uh, a stumbling block to, uh, you know what I mean? Diving into it, and and I had played Shadow of Mordor, so I knew how how the how the game functioned, and I knew how the music functioned in it. So I didn't feel it was quite as important as playing something that I w it was completely new. And I want to hear how my music was used, and you know, get a sense, a true sense of the parameters of of the game. Yeah, because it's a bit different with say a story driven game, right? So because if you pick something up. And then you start playing it and then you don't play it again for two weeks you can come back and be like what was i doing again you know it, it's not the type of game that you can just pick up and play and then it's okay as opposed Plus to some you other... build skills you build skills in the game and and you lose those skills if you don't keep using them yeah that's right. <clears throat> you have to know how to defeat enemies and little tricks and etc to really completely you know, master a game like yeah. every time i played any of these online games where you know like shooter games what somebody like kills me within seconds of me that's, <laughs> that like, sounds I have like no me. chance i have like no chance <laughs> because i don't do it every i need to do it for like a couple of years i need to invest a few years of my life and so i i, I stay away from those because it's no fun for me because they're probably there i know there's there's instances of play, uh, to play it with beginner, you know, levels or whatever, but. Yeah, yeah. So with Destroy All Humans, was the plan always to kind of evoke like an, a 1950s type soundtrack? Was that always yes, the plan? Absolutely. Yes. From day one, 
that's what Emily, they that, that was the direction they were they were giving yes you. yes emily ridgeway the audio director for pandemic in brisbane australia it was made in australia oh. uh was a big fan of bernard herman's score for the day the earth stood still right so that was sort of the model and it since it takes place in the 50s the idea was all right let's do it like a 1950s sci-fi score one of those you know theremin and uh, orchestra kind of approach to emulate that era entirely so to, so play it seriously but from the perspective of the 1950s which does of course you know when we hear the theremin associated with sci-fi movies we kind of uh, smile you know it, it is sort of a a little bit of that maybe, maybe not as much anymore but certainly my generation because when i was a kid you would watch the old movies on tv they were on tv every saturday saturday night usually there would be like all these um sci-fi movies and monster movies you know so you'd watch it, and of course you'd hear the theremin and such so i associate that sound with that era and i'm and i'm also i'm a huge fan of bernard herman Bernard Herrmann is one of my favorite film composers of all time. So it was really fun to write in this quasi in the style of uh, Monsieur Herrmann, you know. Right, right. So you were quite in the know in terms of that era and how the music worked in that era. You didn't have to go away and do too much research. No, I knew how to write. As a matter of fact, the reason they hired me was because I had scored a game that, remember those early, I mentioned the the uh, games that I scored for Philips Interactive. One of those, which was scored with an orchestra here in LA, was a Bernard, in the style of Bernard Herrmann. So I sent them that and they were like, whoa, this is this is really cool. This is exactly what we're looking for. So I, I very much had in my ear and in my mind, I knew what Herrmann's scores sounded like. And right. I was uh, able to, and, and just have fun writing music in that style. And then obviously from there, that led on to Bioshock, <clears throat> right? Right, because the same audio director from Destroy Humans, Emily went on to Irrational, get hired in Boston. In Boston, she left Australia, went to Boston and worked for Irrational Games, which is making Bioshock. And she invited me to score it. So since uh, Bioshock, it was created between two studios. I think it was Boston and then um, Canberra in Australia, I think. But did you... Did no, you... actually not. No? I, th I think you're thinking of Bioshock 2, which, oh, was, right. was, uh, which was not created by Irrational Games in Boston, but was created by um, um, 2K Novato, I think it was called, and by a company... Uh, in Canberra, uh, I think owned by 2K or maybe par they partnered with them. And so, yes, you're correct. It was, that was, and that's a terrific game, by the way. I think Bioshock 2 is wonderful. So did you have to f do multiple flights to these different gaming companies with you being in LA and then flying? No, 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 no. So I, went up all... to, I went up to Nevada once at right. the beginning of the process. Nevada's uh, north of, of San Francisco. Um, so it's just a flight to San Francisco. You rent a car and you drive up for 45 minutes and you're in Novato. It's beautiful. Up They're actually really nice. And uh, spent the day with the team and then flew back that night. And then I just communicated with Michael Camper, who was the audio director on that one. Um, he said what he needed, send me movie files, all the stuff. Everything was done online and or by phone or whatever. Right. So that was how that, and, and similarly with Bioshock Infinite, that was made in Boston. I did fly there once to meet everybody, meet the team. And then, but after that, it was all done remotely. Oh, okay. That's actually interesting. So even back then, you didn't have to do a lot of the face-to-face -face interaction. It was just all remote even back then. It was. It really was. And I would say you to this day, like I'm working on a game that's being made in Japan. So I'm dealing with them. We're using Zoom and of course we share files, you know. How do you do that? Do you need like a translator? Well, as it turns out, the 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 gentleman who is, um, I can't identify 
who these people are. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to be uh, um, in June. Actually, they will go public with it. But he, uh, the one gentleman I deal with, uh, actually, although he is Japanese, he was raised in Los Angeles. So speaks absolutely perfect, unaccented, unaccented English. And so there is no translation issue. It's just like you and oh, I wow. chatting right now. It's absolutely seamless. Um, now, he has colleagues that do not speak English, and that needs to be translated. But I deal mostly with him because for the obvious reason that he's able to communicate without any barrier, without any language barrier or translation, which is, uh, which is a great benefit. Of course, because it would delay everything quite a bit, right? If every single thing has to be translated, even from video calls to emails. Right. And also I've worked with some Chinese companies. Sometimes the translations are not when, especially when you're trying to nail down some kind of mood or different a change that they're requesting, trying to understand what it is they're communicating, can sometimes the language, they may find words, but the words are not nuanced enough to, mm. to be helpful. So it can, it can cause issues. But in this case, we don't have that problem. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> in terms of the licensed music that was uh, put in Bioshock, for example, were you told to keep your music quite close to that? In terms of the no, 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 I di I didn't have any idea what they'd use. Right. I never heard it. I never knew about it. I never knew what would be in the game until, and I never heard it until I actually played the game. Is that with all three of them? Like yes. with licensed music? Yeah. Okay. Right. Had nothing to do with creating the music or advising them on which music to use. That was all done in-house by the audio director or music director. Okay. And they didn't tell you anything? Did they tell you they were going to use licensed music? I can't remember now. <laughs> I, the original Bioshock, I don't remember specifically having that chat. Yeah. You know what? I remember Emily one time asking me about um, the Tchaikovsky um, from the the um, the Nutcracker Suite, she wanted to know the name of the the dance, you know, that they ended up using in the um, in Cohen's uh, in the Cohen's masterpiece. There, the, the was it Dance of the Flowers, Dance of the whatever. I, I'm, I'm blanking on it now, but it, it, it was it's a very famous uh, part. Of yeah, the, I remember suite, the yeah. Cohen's um, piano masterpiece. Yeah, right, right. Well, that I wrote, I composed that. Wow. Okay. And you played it? So you recorded it? No, yeah. I didn't play. I didn't play it. We hired a pianist because it, it. I do play the piano. You can see a piano back there. Yeah, yeah. But I, it, 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 I probably could have learned it, but it was just it. Was, I didn't have the time. It's quite, it's, it's quite a difficult piano. It's piece very complex. Yeah, quite fast yes. and yeah, yeah. So, so hired someone to do that. Yeah, fair enough. Saves a lot of time, right? I don't play any of the violins or cellos either. <laughs> we hired musicians. That's what we hired, hired musicians for. But, uh, you know, I, I uh, had a, when I was at USC, uh, I had a piano teacher there, Bernardo Segal. Bernardo was from Argentina, and it was he was a real interesting character. Besides being a fabulous pianist, he was a concert pianist. He was, he also scored a lot of uh, television shows, including Columbo. And on the Columbo shows, he would he would play his own piano at the recording sessions. Um, but he was I mean he was a concert pianist, and he also was a teaching piano at uh, USC at the time. Uh, so that's where I met him, and I, I was I, that was the first recording sessions I ever went to in LA for for scoring sessions was at Universal Studios where he was he would record the for the Columbo series. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, how did you end up uh teaching at the USC? Well, that was uh just the, about 10 years ago. Brian <clears throat> a gentleman named Brian King was the uh, head of that a program there called Screen Scoring. It actually was called uh, Scoring for Motion Pictures and Television at the time, SMP TV. It, it has now become screen scoring. And they had someone who was teaching scoring for video games, which was an elective then. It wasn't a requirement. It was an elective. Um, 
and he moved into to Northern California. So he wasn't going to be in town. So uh, Brian reached out and uh, I guess he knew somebody who knew me. I don't remember the, all the details of that and asked me if I'd want to teach that class. And I and actually, I, I, by that time, I was, uh, my career, I thought it'd be quite, quite nice, and quite fun to, to do that. So um, I started about 10 years ago. So how many times do you have to teach per month? I go, I teach, well, now it's on Zoom. It's just once a week for a couple hours. That's all. Okay. So prior, prior to the pandemic, though, would you drive to the I campus? I would drive. I'd drive to campus, which I'm not too far. I live in Culver City, which is about 20 minutes away. Oh, that's So nothing. it's not too, yeah. not too bad. No, that's really not bad. And you just park. And, and I kind of like being on campus. That, that was my alma mater. So I, I actually, I really, uh, I've really enjoyed it. That's cool. So it was part of the reason why you were more immersed in gaming, because I know I've read in interviews that the gaming industry doesn't have the egos like, say, Hollywood does. And is that is that made it easier in terms of, you know, getting out there because you don't have to contend with the egos. You don't have to put on the act or sell yourself every single time like you're going into an interview when you're meeting people, when you're networking. Well, you know, you know, when you see a director, you know, risk, you know, he's asked an assistant for a, for a, uh, a, a, a muffin, you know, some kind. And when they get a blueberry and, and they didn't want a blueberry and they throw it at the assistant and say, I told you, I don't want a fucking blueberry muffin. <laughs> then, you know, you're in the wrong business. Um, so, uh, but in any event, I, it, it is tr that, that, that I, there are a lot of lovely people in the film and television industry, but everyone I've met in video games has been really lovely to work with, I have to say. And it, that affects the stress level that you experience when you're working. And it, I, I have to say is a lot less, it has been consistently very low stress working in this industry. And I really like that. Part of one of the things, one of the things I, I disliked about film and especially television was the insane turnaround times where you just had mm. a few days to write a lot of music and stress and et cetera. And, and just, that's just all gone. So I do really feel great about that aspect of it. That's not the only reason. It has also been by far um, more creative in terms of the type of music I've been asked to write. I've never been asked to write more interesting music than in video games. None of the television scores I've, or, or film scores that I wrote were anywhere near as interesting as a Bioshock or a Shadow of Mordor or a Dante's Inferno or a Metamorphosis. You know, these just, these are really vastly more interesting. So from a creative standpoint and then from a personal standpoint, it has been really really uh, wonderful to have been to found this industry and to have been embraced by it and get work uh, it's just the, the best thing that ever I've, I've actually come to reach i used to think you know i wanted to win an academy award or whatever you know and i've come to think that no thank you i really uh, would if I, I wouldn't change anything if I could be working on big films, I'd rather be doing what I'm doing right now. It's just it's just such a great place to be working, both creatively and in terms of um, stress. You know, it's just been, you know, wonderful. Yeah, you actually echo what a lot of other game composers have said, particularly when it comes to the deadline aspect of film and television, which is really intense. I imagine you would have had to do heaps of overnighters. I did. I, 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 when I first got into gaming, I was like, well, this is, too, I still kind of feel it's, you almost, you really have too much time. I would, I would rather <laughs> crank, you know, crank it out, even if, even if it's just moderate cranking, uh, because lots of times you will have a week or two where you have nothing to do because you don't, you don't have anything to work on. And they, and so you'll end up working on it for many, many months, even a year or more. Uh, and, but you, you do often more than one project. Yeah, right. So, so, that, so, so that's been common me. for you to have multiple projects at the same time. Yes, yes. Have you ever been working on a game and say television at the same time? Yes, a, a film actually. Oh, wow. 
Okay. Because um, the deadlines on film are not as, in, as no, intense as television. No, they're not as bad. No, they're yeah. not. Okay. The television is pretty overwhelming most of the time. Not always, but most of the time, it's just really... And often what happens in TV is that composers build teams that help them with the writing. Unless they're super fast. Some composers are, can just write tons of music in a day. I'm, I'm not... I'm fast, but not super fast. So having to write more than two or three minutes a day is a challenge for me. So what's your method? Do you sit there and just jam keys? Do you think of an idea in your head? Do you hum a melody? Like what's your actual process to actually composing a piece? Yeah, well, obviously you're looking at what you're composing it for. Yeah. What what's what what is going on? What style of music would make sense here? Of course, once you've established a style, I mean, there's a, sort of a different process for like finding the idea or the mo motivic ideas for a new game. That's a bigger challenge. But once you've established a style and themes, et cetera, then it's just, you just get up and you look at what, what do I have to do today? And so I, there, just like in a film, every scene in a film or a television show has its own unique, you know, visuals of what's going on. So similarly with games. So you're writing for something. And that of course is limiting in a good way you know uh and then and then you just have to start you know that's the critical thing with any creative <clears throat> process just starting uh is um can, can be the hang up you know but you got to start somewhere and once i start generally ideas start unfolding as i focus fully on it ideas start to come to me i guess that's what makes me a composer that and i've built up technique over many decades of writing you know so i know i know how to do things um i know i know how to write music you know just from experience i have a lot of experience doing it but yeah but you're still trying to find something unique and then and and like just today i was writing something and like i was going upstairs to get a some water or something and i just and i just hummed the next melodic idea that i wanted to use and i go yeah that's going to be really cool you know, and it's just sort of because I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it very, very intensely. And that's when the ideas uh, come and you and you try things and then you, you try things. Then you go, no, that's not working. Erase that, you know, and try something else. Do you ever create something though, and you're thinking, yes, this is great. This is amazing. Then you go away, you come back and you're like, oh, this is crap. Yes. Or the, right. the other way around, you think it's crap and then you go away and you come back and it's good. Well, I, I usually I think it has some some potential, you know, but I'm, I'm, I may be not certain of it. Like, uh, I'm not sure this works. And then I'll come back, go, yeah, that's better than I thought that that is working. Um, and then certainly um, you have something that that you clearly had thought was OK, but then you realize, no, no, this is just painting myself into a corner it's not working and sometimes you even go so far as that you may write some music for instance that may be musically i did just um last week i wrote some music for this game i'm working on and mostly it's going like v1s and v2s for each version i give it a v title v1 v2 v3 uh they've been accepting a lot of v1s you know which is a good sign but i wrote a cue and i was like the music is quite good but I, I, I kind of knew it was wrong for that. But I, but I felt like, well, this is this is this will work. But I'm and sure enough, that they came back and said, you know, here's why this is not working. So and then I got really good feedback, which was quite helpful, which I wish I had gotten earlier, but I didn't. So, um, but that that then permitted me to rewrite that cue, which I just delivered today, actually. Oh wow. Did you, uh, how long did it take you to find Bioshock's definitive sound like that? Because it's got a very that, distinctive sound. That took a while of experimenting and trying things. And actually <clears throat> having Emily, who's who has a great ear, very talented woman, and I would send her things. And she goes, well, that's, she, she had a great way of, of not going, like making me feel intimidated, like I'm screwed. I, 
I'm going to get fired. You know? But she'd go, yeah, that's really cool. And it's not, yeah, let's try, try some more stuff, though. Let's, so she was just really letting me experiment, you know. And, and she did say that she didn't want it to sound like any other film, television, or game score. It had to be quite unique, which is which is kind of intimidating in and of itself. Like really, <laughs> can't select like anything else. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, um, but I, I kind of achieved that. I think uh, it is. It has its own unique vibe to it. Um, not not that I didn't. Not that everything in it is unique, but I think the combination of styles, because I sort of combined two or three different styles, and I think that is what made it unique. Did you get frustrated with yourself though? Because I imagine it took like a, quite a long time to find that distinct sound. As I recall now, it's been a while, but I recall being frustrated and finding it, and and you know, and wanting to find it more quickly than I than I actually <laughs> did. Uh, but you know, eventually it it came, and when it did, you know, it, it was like it couldn't have, it couldn't be anything else but this this is it this is the right style and we both agreed and everyone seemed on the team seemed to feel that way you know was it much harder with bioshock infinite though because bioshock at this stage was well known acclaimed you'd won awards so was there a pressure to try and make it as good the expectations would have been that much higher you to it nail was. the soundtrack. It was. That was one of the most challenging scores I ever did. That was that was di uh, difficult because they, it was it was Bioshock. Bioshock Two was easy, and I think I actually think that score for Bioshock Two rivals or betters the original Bioshock in terms of overall quality. Um, I, I really do. But that said, Bioshock Infinite needed to be different, and Ken Levine, the uh, creative director, said that. And that too, too took some time and experimentation and failing and trying again to find it. Yeah, but I suppose the reward, and it comes back to the whole game composing versus film and television, is you probably wouldn't get an opportunity to create something truly original, right? Because television and film has a specific sound um, to it. So you probably don't get that much time to experiment as say you would with video games? I would say that it's a generalization and there'd be probably a lot of uh, examples where someone could say, well, what about this? And you'd, they'd be absolutely correct. There'd be, there's some fabulous film scores being written and uh, as such. But uh, there are a lot of television, for instance, is quite ambient these days and synthesized. And even though it can, that can be quite effective, and I think it does work, it's certainly not interesting. All to, it's not all that interesting when it's separated from the picture, you know. It's working underneath it. And it also doesn't involve traditional musical technique, like, you know, melody and harmony and rhythm. It's more about sounds and building soundscapes. Um, so I, that that's certainly not true universally, you know. I remember uh, the Queen's Gambit. I thought had a terrific, ter terrific score. I really loved it, and I thought that had a lot of great writing in it, you know. So um, there's a lot. Of, there's still a lot of great music being written, written for film and television, um, but so I'm cautious about generalizing too much. But I will say that at least in my experience, the game music that I've been asked to write has been so cool. I mean, you know, Metamorphosis, uh, I wrote uh, in a style that's reminiscent of the um, you know, early 20th century, um, you know, Schoenberg, uh, Bertolt Brecht, expressionist style of music. And so, and, and used a style of singing that's quite unique called Sprechstimme, and you'd never, get to do that in a film, I think. It would be pretty hard to imagine that being a possibility. So I'd, I'm still just sort of blown away at how creative I'm able to be. And I love that. I mean, that really feeds my my uh, creative spirit. You know, it sounds a little a little catchphrasey, but, <laughs> it, but I, it, it's, it, you know, it has the added advantage of being true, let's, let's say that. Uh, it, it really does. I really enjoy the being creative and, you know, um, 
I don't, you know, if I, if I didn't, if I decided to retire, I could financially, I could do that. That's not a problem. I could absolutely do that. But I continue to work because I absolutely adore and love writing music. But if I had to, if, if someone offered me some, a television show right now, which was very stressful and it involved writing in ways that were, to me, not terribly creative, I think I would say no to that because I don't want to do that. I don't want to be stressed, that stressed writing stuff that doesn't feel good to me creatively. Mm. Um, Particularly if you have the financial freedom to not do it either. Right. And I have, I'm fortunate that I have that. So um, that would be, um, that would be uh, the case. But I, that said, I love working and I, I, I would be really, if I wasn't working, I'd be really, um, Wondering what the hell I was doing with my life. I mean, my I drive my wife crazy as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when creative people don't have anything creatively to do, anything creative to do, I think you can end up going a bit nuts, right? I think so. I think it's important to. to I mean, look, uh, John Williams at eighty nine is still still score is scoring the latest uh, Indiana Jones uh, movie. So. Yeah. Now, being from New Zealand, I couldn't <clears throat> avoid asking you some stuff about Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings type things. How did the whole situation come up with Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor? Because I do know that uh, the Monolith Productions, who designed it, they actually uh, had a lot of contact with Peter Jackson and Weta over the design of the game. Did you have any? Did you speak to Howard Shaw at all in regards to music referencing? No, no, no. And in fact, we were were specifically told we did not need to emulate Howard's music in any way. Was so, that? Sorry, I was going to ask. Was that part of the appeal of creating the soundtrack? No, we weren't required to write in, in the style. And fortunately, I w I had only seen one of the Lord of the Rings movies, which was what? the second one. Yes, really. I had That's only quite seen the rare. second one. That's quite yes, rare. I just, I, I, you know, I just, I, to be honest with you, I wasn't all that interested in seeing them. <laughs> That's not my <laughs> style of movie. I don't like those big fantasy movies generally, um, and I've seen very few Star Wars movies either. I've seen, a, I've seen a few, about three or four of them, um, and uh, so I, that to me was an advantage because I wasn't uh, contaminated with Howard's music, right. Um, so I was able to do that. Now Nathan, who was the in, who is still the in-house composer, uh, music guy at Monolith, was a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. But I, I but I don't think his music sounded like Howard, anyways. He, even though he he had seen all that, he was a complete Middle Earth nerd, you know. <laughs> so he was uh, uh, he was totally um, there and. Uh, but but and he's a he's a wonderful composer. So uh, I, it was but it was it was just a great opportunity to write cool music, lots of cool music, and score lots of cinematics. And uh, working out both games really were fabulous. Just really, I really enjoyed it. And we recorded those actually in Seattle. Ah, the scores. Was was there much direction on that, or were they just like you? come up with something we'll just leave that up well to you. of course I, I was working i'm an i'm a contracted composer so i'm external i wasn't an employee of monolith um nathan was so nathan was my go-to and nathan worked with brian brian palmathon who is the uh audio director who i love but brian i adore brian he's just fabulous and and basically i i mean it, it was mostly just uh nathan they very much trusted us they they heard everything though because the the music was all tested in game as they were building the 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 um, building it you know so they they were constantly putting the music into each build so that everyone heard it and if there was any comments but but really uh, if Nathan liked it I think you know Nathan would bounce stuff off Brian as well but if Brian and Nathan liked it it was in the game. Simple now, as they that. did yeah and it, it you know it's funny because I didn't hear anything about. Uh, about working with anybody other than the Tolkien, the people who represent the Tolkien estate. Those were the people, my understanding, that we were 
required and were part of the creative process and they would come actually up they would actually go up to monolith and listen and see the game see how it was unfolding and of course listen to our music and they had to approve our music fortunately they oh. thought it was they were very happy with it um but we so we never changed a note because of them they pretty much approved everything we were doing but they did have to listen and those were so again the, that's the tolkien estate kind of like marvel you know the marvel uh, has their own company and they have to approve things that go into films. I'm not sure what, how all that works. Uh, I think it starts works. getting quite complex, particularly with the Tolkien estate, because I think certain rights have been sold and certain rights haven't. So different approval process. Uh, so yeah, I don't know how it all works. I mean, I don't know if Peter Jackson and Weta only have access to the film stuff. Like, I, yeah, it's it's very very. Complex. I don't I don't know that either. But I never heard anyone say, oh, Peter Jackson listened and approved or something like that. <laughs> so I did not hear that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Peter Jackson. I think he is an enormously talented director. So I would love to. That that would be cool working on anything um, that he did. I saw his documentary uh, on World War One. Oh, uh, yes, yes. That was absolutely spectacular. Well, and, if I get uh, to talk to him, I'll, um, I'll send him your way. Maybe. Send him... <laughs> So it's in my uh, Zoom address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Because with the approval process of the to Tolkien estate, like, how long did it take? Was it a couple of days, like a week before they approved anything? Well, I think they came out at different stages as the game was being developed over uh, literally a period of a year, uh, both games. So they would get visits, uh, I don't know, every quarterly or whatever, you know, to listen not just the music all the assets were being presented to them and so they would look at the artwork and the game was functionality the scripts music all those aspect creative aspects of the game they had to approve and um they seem and, and of course they they were they were i from what i heard i was not in on any of those meetings they were delighted with the with the game oh. well i imagine if you were in those meetings you'd be a bit nervous wouldn't you I don't know if I'd be nervous, but uh, yeah, I, I'd certainly feel uncomfortable if they were going, "Oh, this music sucks." <laughs> That'd be, I'd be all crap. <laughs> I think that would be <laughs> anyone, right? <laughs> we're screwed. <laughs> so, I, but I, I was, you know, I mean, um, Nate would always tell me, "Hey, you know, we have Tolkien's coming in next week, so we're built doing a whole presentation, so we want to get this cue done." And, and of course, I was always anxious to hear how they responded you know but then it kind of seemed like it since the response was sort of universally uh positive i, I start stopped worrying too much about it because it just seemed like part of the process and and we weren't changing our style or anything we were we had already sort of developed ideas that they then approved you know yeah fair enough did um when bioshock came out and you won all these awards and everything were you getting approached to do games and then they asked you to make the soundtrack similar to Bioshock? No, I didn't. I didn't say that. It certainly that was a very successful game, and the score was uh, received very well. And it definitely gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have had. Um, I Dante's Inferno, for instance, I never would have scored that without. I mean. <clears throat> Paul Gorman said that he's he hired me because of Dante's because of Basha you know so uh but they weren't saying imitate this no they, they weren't saying that uh they just felt it was a cre very creative um score and I probably could do something creative for their game you know because mm. the only reason why I ask is sometimes when a composer does such a a magnificent score they can sometimes get typecast, right, as right. that guy. And considering you won all these awards and everything for it as well, the huge success. I mean, obviously, it opened the floodgates for you in terms of. I think I think that the music though is so idiosyncratically Bioshock that unless someone is wanting their game to sound like they're imitating Bioshock, that they wanted me to do something, you know, unique for their game. So I think that they saw, okay, Gary can can create a very unique title. 
I mean, none of my music prior to Bioshock sounded anything like Bioshock. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like someone tasked me to do something really unique and I was able to do it and pull it off. So I think I'm I'm I think what actually happened, which which is very good, is that people hired me to do distinct and, and interesting projects, you know? Yeah. I, I, I maybe wasn't getting some of the more, you know, uh, Medal of Honor or, you know, those kind of games um but the cool to what was cool to me would you was, want to do those type of games medal of honor or call of duty or any of those first person shooters you know i've been sort of introduced to some of the people that make those um i would i'd be open to it sure if um you know if they wanted me to do something unique for them sure absolutely hmm. Is there, um, is there a particular franchise you haven't worked on or a particular genre that you haven't worked on that you'd like to work on? You've done a lot, so it's hard to... I have done a lot of different that. genres. Uh, I, I think it would be cool to do, a, to do... I've always kind of had the fantasy of scoring a Western film, like a, a really good Western. Um, and that, so maybe a game that was a Western would be kind of cool to do that. Um <clears throat> I mean, I didn't even think that anyone would create a, a, a game based on Franz Kafka's books, not to, not only Metamorphosis, because Metamorphosis is based upon the Tower and other famous works by the the great author, you know. Right. Um, but who would have thought, you know, oh, I'm waiting for the that Kafka game to come <laughs> my way. It just all of a sudden presented. And as soon as I heard, well, Kafka, of course, is was such an interesting and creative and bizarre known for his sort of um, out there ideas that immediately appealed to me, you know? So I, you know, I'm trying to think of something that, that I've got, I'm just, I'm dying, dying to a score um, X, Y, Z. Um, I don't know. I, I, I it, it just something where I can, where they're asking for me to be, creative you know and um open to ideas that i might present you know not not too um locked in stylistically um so that i i can but you know you still you still are scoring their film or television or video game so they they are entitled to, to have their input of course and in fact you know they are they're the last word so if they don't like something you wrote it's not going to end up in the in the game or in the film or or etc so you do have to please your employers and i'm very aware of that and i'm very aware of the need to find something but but if it if they are the, the more more creative people are open to really creative different kind of um approaches to their their scores you know I mean, do you have to chase projects now, or do you just get the offers coming in all the time? Since Bioshock, they, 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 they don't come in all the time. They okay. they they come in. They come enough. They come in enough to keep me busy. But it's not. You know, there's projects that I've been up for that I haven't gotten. That I would have. That I pitched for. Literally wrote demos for, and try, and and somebody else got them. You know, and I thought I would have done a terrific job on them. So I, I certainly am not at that point where I'm getting everything I want, you know, as, as the old Rolling Stone song goes, you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. So I kind of I kind of get what I need, but I don't that I don't necessarily get everything I want, <laughs> which maybe is a good thing, you know. I think maybe it's, it's that's a healthier thing for for yeah. you to not. I think if you got everything you wanted, you can sometimes um, get almost like an entitlement, sense of entitlement sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Take it for granted and not be fulfilled and not have. To. It's the things you fight for that really are the more the things that are the most satisfying. And when you're challenged to write something different and you find it and it and and everyone seems pleased, that's that's the most satisfying thing I think from a composer's perspective. That really is cool. Have you done any voice acting? This might sound weird, but you've got like a really, really good sounding voice. So I'm wondering if the studios ever asked you to do a little bit of voice acting while you're working on a score. I was going to make a joke. 
<laughs> you can't like, still make I the joke. The, I was the voice for Boshak. No, <clears throat> no, I, I, you know, I haven't. I've never, I have never done that, um, and no one's ever asked me <laughs> to do that. You know, I think you can have a good voice, but you also have to, be, have to be an actor, I think, to do it well. And I'm, and I've never studied acting, and I don't have any particular acting talent. I don't think, you know, I, I think many people have fantasized about being an actor because you grow up watching films and television, et cetera. So I've had those fantasies, but I've never pursued it at all. I've never thought, wow, I, should, I, would, be, I would be the next Pacino if only, you know. <laughs> well, that's what a director's for, right? They give you the direction. You just have to say the lines. That's it. Yeah, but I don't have any, ta- I don't have any acting talent. So I, that, that, that said, you know, it's one thing for us to converse freely and I don't feel any, there's no cameras going. I, I suppose this is being recorded, so there's some pressure. But I, I actually uh, enjoy talking to people and, and doing interviews and things. So, but I, well, thank you very much. Uh, um, that's, that's a nice compliment to know. Maybe I'll, on the, my next gig, I'll have my agent add that to the <laughs> <laughs> VO. Gary does, you know, VO. <laughs> voice acting. Yeah, no, you know, good voice actors are amazing. And you oh, hear, and good. you just hear it when somebody, when, when you hear bad, like mediocre narration, you're going, oh, crap. Yeah, I don't know if you listen to audible audio books. Like I do, audible. yeah, yeah. And every now and then you get a, a reader who is like, just blows you away. I mean, they're just so good. And you go, oh, that's, that's talent. That is really, there's a guy who, I don't know if you ever heard of Cormac McCarthy, the author, um, but he um, he wrote no no country for old men. The, oh the right, yes. Cohen's brothers made into a film, and the road, which was also made into a film. But he wrote a book called Blood Meridian, which is maybe his greatest book. It's like Shakespearean, uh, in 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 terms of how he uses language. It's brilliant. But the uh, the guy who reads it for Audible is a, a, he is a, uh, a genius. I don't know, genius is the right word, but he is an extraordinary talent. What he does, I, I've just, he is like the best audible. He, I, 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 will, I actually have um, found other books just because he was reading them. I wasn't even interested in the subject. I just wanted to hear him read them. But, but in, in Blood Meridian, that is a, a uniquely, um, a unique performance. So, True, truly great. I mean, we've gotten off on voice acting, but that's that's what a real talent can do. They can really just you know make make your make you uh, glued and completely lose yourself in in the story. Yeah, when it's done well. The only reason why I ask is obviously you being based in California and and uh, LA in particular as well. It's like the hub of creativity, right? There's a lot. So, I mean, there's a lot of actors in. LA. There is. So I'm wondering take, I don't if you want to take their work, let them, let them. <laughs> or if you unintentionally kind of absorb some of that. You know the saying. You know you, um, the company you surround yourself with. You kind of subconsciously pick pick up parts of them. So I'm just wondering. If I've you... known a lot. I've known a lot of actors. You know, I, I certainly like them, and uh, I have had girlfriends who are actors over the years, <laughs> um, and such. So I, I, I like I like actors and I like that, but I, that that does not mean and I and I actually lived with an actress for a while many many years ago, um, and my wife is a therapist now. My current wife. That's just sort of acting though too, um, <laughs> but in any event, uh, um, I don't mean that to, to be disparaging towards therapists. By the way, <laughs> no, no, of course not, of course not. It's actually good. It's good to yeah. have a therapist. Right. I get free therapy every day, all exactly. day long. <laughs> exactly. Right. For free. Because therapists free. Can, no some, charge. can sometimes be expensive, right? So, yeah. Well, come to think of it over the years, it, it has been expensive. But um, <laughs> my wife, my, hi, honey, you know, um, she's upstairs actually doing therapy online. Oh, wow. A lot of, th- a lot of therapy has um, moved over into online therapy and Zoom. Which is which she actually she really likes, you know. But in any event, um, I, I do think that uh, great voice acting is 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 wonderful. And there's a I mean, there's a lot of actors working in video games. It's a it's a big part of the industry now. And the, the certainly SAG after which is the you know the union 
representing actors, uh, has totally embraced uh, video game. Um, yeah, well, it um, it grosses more than television and film combined now. Yes, I mean, it does. It's, it's truly, uh, truly like a behemoth in terms of, you know, a, a multi um, phenomenal like industry. It's just, it's crazy, and it's just still, it's still getting bigger. In fact, I think COVID you know, is making more yes. people buy video games. So it's even bigger. I think so. I think that it, it's been a good time for the video game industry. Um, um, I'm, I'm just not, and it's unfortunate we need it. We didn't need a pandemic to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to improve the sales, but uh, <laughs> I think it's worked out that way. I think uh, video games is one of those entertainments you can do at home and not, you know, not have to worry about being out in the world. And so a lot of people have, have, have embraced it, but it has been moving in that direction for many years now. And it, yes, it is, just, it's just a huge, huge, uh, successful. It gets, you know, every now and then it, it gets criticized for some, the violence, you know, uh. that, but you know, I mean, the, the same, the same people, I mean, go and see uh, unbelievably violent films. And I'm not sure why that's, uh, any less, uh, <sighs> You know. I think I think because it's when you compare it to other, you know, things such as film and television, it's still kind of in its infancy. It really kind of only really blew up, kind of in the early two thousands. I think that's when it started to really get big, and it still hasn't even peaked yet. So, I mean, you're not going to have any problems finding work, I'm sure. Like, yeah. no, but but people my age, because I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> are really don't play much video games but people and you know i'll tell you what's interesting is that i get my agent gets calls from me from for very young directors interested in my work because they played the games that i've scored so oh. just recently an, an australian producer contacted my agent about scoring uh, an australian film um it has it ha, i've not been we've not signed the deal but it's certainly a possibility but uh, and so she asked, and he goes, he, she, he was a big fan of Bioshock. As simple as that. And uh, so that 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 is quite interesting. Whereas a an a, a older director might never have played a video game and have disdain for video games. So you see you see that, but you do not see. And I'll tell you, this is interesting. My students at USC in the last decade, when I first started teaching there, I a good percentage of the students were just interested in scoring film and television. They were not interested in video games and and would say so. And now it's almost the opposite. A number of the students are saying, I don't want to do film and television. I just want to score video games. That is it, that I've seen that go like that from this, from left to right, just a complete change in attitude. And the younger students are, the newer students, because they're all about the same age when they become a student, um, are gamers very often, and th and prior to that, some of them were serious gamers, and some, many of them weren't. So it's just really been um, a big change in attitude about gaming, and the interest of composers for gaming is enormous. Hmm. Final question before I wrap up: In terms of your students, like, what's the biggest mistake you think that a lot of young composers make or up and coming that want to get into game composing that they don't fully understand or the biggest piece of advice you'd like to give them? Well, first of all, it is um, critical to understand that it is a unique industry and meaning the crossover from film and television into gaming is very minimal. <clears throat> it's completely, almost a completely unique set of people and you have to create contacts in that industry you, you the only the only time i ever see anyone who from film and tv are usually writers they will hire writers to write scripts you know and there's a lot of dialogue and and and, uh, and and they are bringing in talented you know script writers to do the scripts for games so that's that's the, the only place i see overlap and occasionally composers like myself who've worked in both genres but the folks at the development teams, they're really not, it's just rare that they, oh yeah, I was, uh, I worked on a film, I was a film editor, now I'm, you know, writing code for 
but I just don't see that very often. So it's a unique set of people. You have to meet them. You have to under, and of course, if they're in my, if they're studying with me, they're going to understand all, all the basics of interactive composition and what it entails. So they're going to learn that. But if you haven't taken my courses or, and you haven't, but you know, look, there's so much to read online. There's you you can educate yourself in many ways, you know. Mm -hmm. But but yes, yeah, but they they seem some people do come in genuinely having genuinely having no concept of how interactivity works in game music. But they they don't leave my class uh, uh, not knowing that they come out really familiar with it. So I don't know. I it's every you know. I told you my story how I got involved in games. And so when people ask me how do they get involved in games, they go, well, you have to send over a fax and have your girlfriend from college, his roommate, be working there. <laughs> <laughs> but the re what, what that really means is it's a joke to say that everyone has this sort of unique way of entry into the system. There's no kind of like standard, you know, maybe in the 1950s in Hollywood, you would start working at a studio as an orchestrator. And then they would start, then they would, you know, you would talk to the head of music and say, and say, hey, I really want to score. And then all of a sudden they throw like a, a, a B movie at you, like a really kind of or a short or something that you score. If you did well on that, maybe they eventually you'd get a B movie. And then if you did well on that, you know what I mean? There was a system, but there's no system really. You have, it's catch as catch can. You have to find, generally, you're going to find that low budget independence are going to be more risk takers because they don't have any money for one thing. So they, they're in a position of um, not having the money. So you can get experience. And then every now, one of that, every now and then one of those blow up, blows up and becomes really successful. And then your music can get recognized and then people will start to hear about you. So it just have to, you have to be very focused and you have to be very serious about it. And, and, uh, and then, uh, Maybe a little lucky. Uh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> what, what did Napoleon say? Yeah, combination of multiple factors. Yeah, Napoleon yeah. said that his favorite characteristic of his generals was was luck. <laughs> he he preferred lucky generals. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the luckier the lucky composers have breaks. I do think there's enormous talents that never have found their ability to to be creative. And I think that's tragic, you know, but they just, you know, and I, and I, I would never have written the Bioshock music or Dante's Inferno or Shadow of Mordor or many others if someone hadn't hired me and said, okay, here's the problem, score this. Oh, okay. Then I came up with music to, to fit that. Yeah. So I'm just so lucky that I got the opportunity, the creative opportunities, because it's permitted me to write some really cool stuff. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question because I, but I hear that that's ultimately the question that every young composer or someone starting out wants to know. And it's like, there's no easy answer. There's sort of the, you know, you just have to, you really have to be, you know, you got to be there and meeting people and honing your skills and learning and scoring any damn thing that comes your way. And fingers crossed that something, you know, something yeah. hits, you know. I mean, the realistic thing is that everyone in the creative industry is not going to get that opportunity. There's just, no. it's too oversaturated, right? So there's only going to be a small portion, a small pool of people that will really get that opportunity. And I think it's important that people realize that. Um, I think you've got to be realistic. But I obviously think, think, be yes. ambitious at the same time. Yeah. 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 Well, hey, this has been great thank you so much for doing this gary i very hey, very welcome. much appreciate it so I where can it. where can everyone find all your music and social media and all that jazz? well i do have a website um that believe it or not is gary .com. think of that what are the chances of that uh but coincidentally that's what it's called and you can go there a lot of my music is there to listen to of course on youtube there's tons and tons of music some of my scores are available to you know to for sale but you, you know you can certainly on youtube you know everything's available on youtube i go to youtube all the time to listen to stuff you know so do i yeah. it's just it's just like you type in somebody's uploaded it and how how cool is that so yeah i mean um 
and I I have a Facebook. Um, I use Facebook. I do not use any other social media. I have an Instagram account, which I don't go to. I don't have a Twitter account anymore. I dropped my Twitter account. I'm To be honest, I don't love social media. Can I admit that? Is that okay to admit that? <laughs> hey, I'm the same. I don't like it. I mean, I only use it because I have to for this, but otherwise I probably wouldn't use it. So, hey, I truly understand. Yeah, I'm just not, I'm not that. Uh, yeah, every now and then though, like something really cool comes out of it. I'll be, in, uh, someone will contact me or um, I'll hear about something on Facebook and I go, you know what? I never, I bought, I almost bought a car <laughs> oh, <laughs> because Facebook. on Facebook. Yeah. But it, one of my good friends, she was one of my good friends and she was selling her Lexus with, was had very low mileage at a really good, and she just put her, she just put a thing up and I saw it and I go, and I reached out to her and I said, Ooh, I kind of need a car right now. And I loved that car. I just, that was just such a great car of such a great price. So I, I bought a car because a friend of mine was like, Telling her, telling her, hey, anybody interested in my uh, Lexus? Uh, uh, and I was like, ended up because, and I knew her because I knew she was the kind of person that would not abuse a car. You know, she was very uh, sort of a, not not someone I could imagine racing <laughs> racing it or anything or crashing it and trying to sell it to people. So I, I, it was that. So yeah, things like that and other things where people have contacted me and reached out for work relationships. And so it's been really, I have to say that there are some really cool things, but there's some ugly stuff on, uh, on the social network. So I don't know. It, it's, it's a, it's a mixed bag. It isn't everything. There's nothing. Everything is a yin and a yang. There's a dark side and a light side to it all. And it's just the humans are, are the greatest and the worst. <laughs> <laughs> they really are but you have your own therapist for all the dark side so. i do i just go talk to my wife and yeah. I'm, I'm good <laughs> <laughs> cool thanks a lot gary i You're very welcome. much appreciate it cool well, sure. that's the show everyone make sure you share like and subscribe and until next time stay safe